Packers had just started the season. The Thorns were just starting preseason. You know, we, you know, March, uh, our first game was March 1st, right? So we were all in and getting everything rolling at the beginning of the season. And, you know, the beginning of the season, everybody's a champion, right? Everybody's excited. You know, nobody knows what's going to happen. There's a lot of um, anticipation. Our, this is our coach's third season with the team. And um, he's been very successful, Giosu Savarizi. And the Thorns, there was a lot of uh, excitement with that team, too. So um, I think, you know, and then, and then we started hearing about, oh, you know, there's some, some, some infections happening up in Seattle. Uh, you know, then there was the whole NBA situation where, it, you know, the news came out right before the game that a player was, was uh, infected and they shut the game down, like, in almost, in, I mean, the fans were in the stands and they were canceling the game. And that, I think, I'm trying to remember, I could go back and look, but you know, it was not much longer after that, that, um, you know, we, we were, I think it was <laughs> Friday, I think it was Friday, March 13th, which, which, you know, is an auspicious day always on Friday the 13th, but that was really, I believe my last day in the office. And then we set up work from home situations across the company beginning the following week. Um, and, uh, you know, adjusting to different news with the league, with the different government, um, recommendations and, and, um, requirements um and i think you know we we as a company i feel we you know we've we've handled and adjusted pretty quickly um you know there's there's the business side and the soccer side and there's all sorts of challenges that come with both of those um but i know from a, from a business and content side we we sort of had to retool everything very quickly and rethink about what we were going to do next yeah because you had what four or five months of planning yeah. when the mls cup final was november uh yeah it was in november yeah. they, they they you know they changed the up this the playoffs just last year um so it was it was it was an odd um situation for us because t- typically you know that they used to have two-legged playoff system and so with, between that and the fall and international breaks in there mls cup ha- wasn't happening until december like in 2018 we went to mls cup and that was december early december um we, we lost but but it was still a long long season um, whereas this one, we were done, you know, we were done before Thanksgiving. So early, even MLS Cup was done before uh, beginning of Thanksgiving, which was beginning of November. Um, and the Thorns, too. Um, we Both teams made the playoffs, although we didn't go as far. So, yes, to your, to your original question, we had a longer off season. We were heading into, this would be, this is our 10th MLS season. So we had a lot of content and activations built up around that, some, some of which we're still doing. Mm. Um, we certainly, you know, a lot of teams talk about like archival content because they were leaning hard into that now that we're in this sort of um, break. We had a lot of that prepped because we were planning to, to look back at 10 seasons worth of stuff anyway. So, so that was actually a kind of an interesting starting point for us with some of that stuff. Yeah, because I mean, you have all these plans, as you say, you've got some that you can still reuse, but you're having to repackage, reformat re-look at oh, yeah. how everything's done because it's not just yes we can use this content but it's how you use it as well because the tone shifts as well from being kind of s- celebrating the new season to having to be a lot more kind of restrained with that tone as well i mean how did you yeah. initially cope with you and the team what was what was the first things that you did well i think you know we our content team is is um spread obviously we have both Timbers and thorns to cover, so we had to consider, you know, strategies for both. The audiences are certainly related, but also unique in their own ways. Um, our content team involves um, digital, social. Um, I'm I'm part of the marketing department, but obviously we work closely with our broadcast team. We we we, we spent, I mean, very early on that for first Monday or Tuesday, we had some very long Zoom meetings, right? Um, and really looked at like, okay, well, let's let's throw. Let's throw out some different ideas. Let's think about this differently. Um, you know, we started with some of that archival content. We started doing weekly rebroadcasts over the air on like television broadcasts of, um, you know, famous games from past seasons for both Timbers and Thorns. And those um, actually, all things considered, did, did pretty well in terms of the ratings. Mm. Um, some of those we also then, you know, we put up on the site. We'd have active social uh presences for both of those games um you know we we i joke i was joking with somebody the other day (laughs) um in in some ways you know everybody was trying to figure out you know what's what's life like for people at home right and and i said you know it's like we've we've turned into a lifestyle magazine in a way you know we started talking about 
what players are doing at home. So like, what was their favorite uh, recipe, food dish? You know, what are some of the favorite movies they like to watch or, or music they like to listen to or video games they like to do or hobbies that they like to explore? All things that um, are very uh, off the field type lifestyle subjects. And so we started building a lot of content around those. I think, you know, when we first uh, went into sort of this, this break, um, you know, there was still a thinking that, oh, well, you know, it's only going to be two weeks or it's going to be four weeks, you know, the, the, the end date kind of kept Yeah, moving. it's been pushed back, what, three times already? Because I think it's right. right. June is the, is the next one. So June is, is in theory the next one, right? You know, I mean, but I think when we were even working on our plans, we we're like, oh, well, we'll, we'll probably be back in June. Um, and I think that people thought that, but then as you kind of go through the, the time period, um, you know, more uncertainty started to happen. Um, and just, you know, more knowledge too, about how the, uh, virus is infecting different parts of society. So, you know, do we look at, and the league is, you know, said, and the commissioners talked about like, do we play behind closed doors? Okay. Well, if that's the case, that's what's, what kind of content do we think about for that? Um, do, are they playing in neutral sites? You know, if we, are playing in neutral sites who's allowed into those games can we do we get content people in there how do you get them in safely you know what's what's how do you do the broadcast you know um so every department i think is really having to think and stay uh, are you planning nimble. for all the different scenarios at the moment or are you just kind of having them in the back of mind and thinking and then just waiting for what looks like is going to happen i think it's a little bit of both i mean obviously you know we're, we're six weeks in now um, <clears throat> which is kind of crazy to think about. And I think the first thing we're doing a lot of lately is looking at the content we initially sort of sketched out. And, you know, we now have, you know, some numbers to look at, you know, both digital and social, um, both of which are very um, atypical, you know, <clears throat> than we typically would have at this type of, time of season, obviously, because we don't have games. Um, but you start to see, you know, well, um, what, what are people responding to versus what are they not? Um, and also, what are the, some of the stories? I mean, a lot of the initial stories, we would do interviews with players like, well, how are you doing at home? And you can only do so much yes. of those before people be like, oh, well, okay, <clears throat> I'm, in the same, I'm in the same boat too. So is this really that interesting? Um, yeah, yeah, you're kind of flogging the dead horse a little bit by the end of it. Right. The and then, and then like when you say, you know. The end of the planning is. Exactly. I mean, and then I think too, we, we started looking at like, okay, well, what are the in terms of the return to play scenarios, there's sort of the return to play at training and you know, looking at other leagues like Germany, they started to have trainings in small groups and started to expand that. Um, how are teams building content around those? Like in the Bundesliga, I think we've been spending a lot of, uh, taking a good look at. Um, then there's also, you know, return to play like on the field and what, and like, so, you know, what does that look like? I, I mean, I, I don't think people are, are you know, the question about when do fans come in and when do fans want to come in is another part of that question. Yeah. Um, is something that's still very much um, up in the air. I think, though, finding ways to uh, engage with fans and keep them integrated into the experience in some way is something that I think we're all trying to figure out. Yeah, what kind of things have you found that have worked best and maybe not quite worked as well as you thought they had? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, we have a writer, I have a writer that's a, a we call him Statman. Um, he loves stats. And so you've got Statman Stumper, haven't you? Yeah, exactly. And that actually, you know, you know, this is Mike, his name is Mike Donovan. Mike um, will, he'll look up things like what the, what's this, the team's record under a full moon? You know, he's got that. He'll keep his own stats. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, we started doing those trivia things, which we had, you know, toyed around with here and there previously, but fans really jumped into those, especially in comparison to other pieces. And so we're like, well, let's keep this going. And that's a piece of content too. You know, I said to Mike, I was like, you know, we don't know how long this is going to go. Do you think you can keep coming up with trivia? And he's like, oh yeah, don't worry. I can come up with trivia. <laughs> so I think it's also the kind of piece too that we could continue to use afterwards, you know. Um, you know, our other <clears throat> primary writer, uh, Richard Farley, has been doing some interesting pieces and he really looked at it from a perspective of like both, you know, how do we want to cover things? And we've had media availability with coaches and players and talking to them about different things. And so there's sort of a news element, but also he started thinking like, you know, what are pieces that we think when we look back at this time that kind of archive this, this period of time, you know? So talking to the players about, you know, new players that had come over from Europe and played, you know, one 
one player had played two games with us, Dario Zuperich, and the other one was still coming off injury and hadn't, hadn't really played either. And now they're stuck in this new environment and not only separated from their familiar homes in Europe, but also separated in a way from their teammates because they're not able to see them. I mean, they're doing, you know, the team's doing pretty active Zoom calls with coaches and teammates and all sorts of things, but it's, you know, everybody's supposed to be self-isolating. So what is that experience like? And I think those are pieces where people started to, you know, see, um, you know, it's simple, not necessarily not sympathizes in the word, but, but see similarities between in some ways, their own experiences. Yeah, they well, can connect home. with the situations. Right. And balancing home life and work life. I mean, the players have a work life that's obviously different than, than you or I, um, but they're balancing between home responsibilities, staying safe. Um, in some cases, you know, a lot of the players have kids, some of which are in school age and balancing, um, you know, remote learning, which is a challenge for, I think, every parent that has a kid that's in school, you know, in a, some sort of homeschool situation um, that haven't had to deal with that before. I know that's something we, we juggle, let alone, you know, two parents that are also trying to work from home um, at the same time. Um, you know, my wife is a, a graphic designer and artist. You know, these are her, this is her paintings and stuff in the background and trying to like, we're, we share this office. So, uh, you know, who's in the office at what time, who's balancing with the kids, who's taking the dog for the walk and all that stuff. So I think finding stories that also reflect some of that experience with some of the players and um, uh, even training staff and coaching staff is true, I, I, or is, is, is interesting. We, we did a story with um, you know, our team chefs who had figured out a way to continue to gener- you know, um, cook and prepare meals for the players and um, figured out a safe way to deliver them but they also expanded that to some of you know our, our team is interesting we're 10, 10 seasons into mls but we go all the way back to the old north american soccer league and so the team is over um, almost 40 years old now in terms of having a presence of some kind in portland and some of those early um players are still in the area but older now and elder not you know in some cases elderly and so trying you know our our, our, our uh, team staff um looked at and the team chef said, well, could we, could we deliver them to people, to other staff or other alumni in this case who are in need and or at risk in some way that we could find a way to safely deliver. So I think that it's, it's um, that finding and, and, and ferreting out those stories, I think have been something that we've, we've tried to explore in different ways. And how crucial have the staff and the players been with coming up with ideas of things that might work? Have they been quite active in coming to you saying, well, I've got some time and I think this would really work. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, it's, it, we had always had, we have a good relationship with our GM and we would have, you know, weekly conversations in normal times. Um, and he's been very um, keen to work with, he's always been keen to work with us, but even, even now, you know, finding ways, not just to look at different stories and tell them in different ways, but also to keep players engaged in different ways. And also the flip side of that too, being respectful of players' times and their own mental states, because they might be like, you know what, I just, I'm not feeling it right now for whatever reason. And it's, it's a, you know, it's a different time. So you, you have to, you know, everybody is self isolating and taking their own space, but you also literally have to kind of give them their own space too, in some cases. So I'd say for the most part, our players have been, fantastic and responsive and and eager i mean we've had you know the other side of one of the other big parts parts of my job is the esports side and so we've had some players that i know are gamers but not necessarily streamers and trying to figure out ways to get them connected get them the right equipment it's been a bit of a um a slog to get some of that set up but i know the yeah, it's interest quite hard to get, get hold of at the moment I mean, right yeah i mean even the the the, <laughs> the capture cards are suddenly at a, at a premium in some cases now so um, cause everybody's like, Oh, let's, you know, let's go stream from home. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, uh, for the most part, I think players, um, have been really, really responsive and really, um, great to work with for sure. Mm. Have you shifted some of your content towards the, um, gaming side as well? Because, you know, you got the EMLS, which was going ahead anyway, then there was the kind of new tournament that took place to kind of fill some of the broadcast gap as well. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, for us, it's been interesting. Our, we, you know, we hosted one of the EMLS events in February, which seems like eons ago. Um, you know, the League Series Two, League Series, the EMLS Cup was supposed to happen at South by Southwest in March, um, and that actually, interestingly, was one of the first things, even before we went into a work from home 
set up, you know, South by Southwest canceled their whole conference. And I, yeah. and that was kind of an interesting moment because everybody was like, wow, that's a, that's a, that's a big deal. Cause that's a huge economic that was, driver. For that's a huge international. So the oh. amount of people flying in and out would have been horrendous. So EMLS had to kind of retool and think, okay, well, could we play online? Could we figure out, you know, the, the network and latency issues become a challenge. They built their, the EMLS tournament special, which became really interesting. We are not participating in it. They had to sort of limit how many teams they, they could have in it to see. Um, our EMLS gamer, Edgar Guerrero, um, RCTID Tiago, is a good player. He lives in a more rural part of um, the state. He lives about an hour south of here, kind of near wine country, actually, if you are familiar with the Willamette Valley. Um, and his home internet is off of a satellite, so he had, high, uh, you know, difficult latency issues with connecting to stream he would normally stream out of his his dad's office is what he would usually do so we had to kind of with work from home we're like well i don't want to ask you to go into the office um because it's not safe and we're only now beginning to see like as things start to kind of open up and figure out what might safe and and work you know does that does that change that possibility so i think on the league level they've leaned hard into it and i've seen a lot of teams do it i think we're also trying to get more up and running we've done some of our game rebroadcasts for the thorns we've been co-streaming those on twitch um we've been running some you know weekly just game simulations just the fifa running their own simulation and starting to see you know just building some um schedules around those things to try and build a familiar or, you know familiarity that these presences are are happening and with some regularity so i think you know we're the long and the short of it is in some ways we're in a bit of a initial stages in some of that, but I do think that there's still a lot of um, uh, possibilities there. And we're, we're looking at some other projects and getting interest from different MLS teams. Like, you know, everybody initially we did before we even went into a hardcore work from home, we did do like a, we would have played new England with that second weekend that everybody was home. And so we had our, before Edgar was sort of lo locked down at home, he was able to play his new England counterpart in a stream. And people started to try and build content around who you would have played that week um, from a from an esports perspective. Um, and I think now people are also seeing like like LAFC has been doing some really interesting charity streams, um, but they're also looking at like, OK, well, we don't really know what the schedule is going to be like. Let's if we have a good idea and we have an, another interested club or partner that we think would be good with this, that makes sense. Let's let's find a way to put it up on Twitch or or Facebook or what have you, um, and see and see what kind of content we can build from that. Yeah, I mean, this time, I mean, if say one of the opportunities of it is to test a lot of things that might have been kind of ideas that have been on the back burner a little yeah. bit, or you think, oh, oh, we don't know if this is going to work or not, so you know, let's stay on the safe side. Now it's like let's just try everything. And do you think you're taking that approach and how do you think that's then going to translate into when things, whatever normal is when we get back to it, what's going to stay? And do you think there's changes that will stay with that? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, going back to sort of that lifestyle magazine approach in some ways, you know, that, that people talk about soccer, lifestyle, sport, lifestyle, sport, culture. Um, I think, you know, building that, um, internally but you know words i mean i think we did a fairly good job of it before but like you say we're also able to say hey well let, let's talk about your dog or let's you know what, these are things that we wouldn't normally discuss uh, but we think are interesting and we think fans would find it interesting and a way to build more affinity with the club um, let's continue that and you know when things start to return to normal we could probably do it in an even broader sense because we can for one thing we can hopefully sit in the same room and, and discuss this you know or go visit that person and see more about their dog in this example so um i think yes i think that there's there's certainly opportunities where we've we've tried to figure out different things um and had a little bit more freedom that i think i hope will help continue um as we move back into more normal gameplay sort of situations do you think it helps bring fans closer to the club and closer to the players as well? Because they're suddenly seeing that, you know, what the struggles they're having and how they're trying to help each other. And because there was this, especially over in Europe, this kind of gulf developing between the players and the fans, that this um, could actually help heal some of those rifts. I, I mean, I suppose that depends on from club to club and how, you know, how successful that club was being on and off the field, you know, 
um, they, they, they joke that winning always helps, but, um, but it's not, that's not the, the silver bullet, you know, um, in terms of, of, of everything you can, you can still have a greatly successful team and have lots of people still unhappy. I mean, I suppose that's sports right there. Everybody wants, uh, fans are always going to want more. Um, so I think in our case, I think we've seen fans um, engage with players um, in different ways, both things, sometimes players doing their own things. We, we had a press release announcement yesterday. Uh, one of our goalkeepers, Jeff Antonella, had also started writing. Um, he's written books, children's books, both mostly based off of sporting stories. So he's a story about LeBron James bringing a title to Ohio or the Cubs finally um, uh, breaking the curse and winning the World Series, and he and he would write children's books, and so he did a he donated about a thousand copies of his books to a a, a nonprofit in Chicago about the Cubs, and you know the Cubs retweeted us, and um, I think fans kind of got into it because because um, it was a player that was looking at at what's going on. It's like, well, what are some other things I can do to help? You know, um, we did a, a stand together, which is our big community outreach platform worked with one of our um, partners, Jersey Mike's, which is a um, sandwich chain, national sandwich chain, but the local uh, affiliates helped um, basically pack and put together up to a thousand, over a thousand meals that they were distributing to, um, you know, low income families in different neighborhoods that especially with like, you know, with school out, you know, school lunch is still a big issue for a lot of, a lot of kids. And this was a way, you know, working with this other nonprofit, to um, partner with a with a corporate partner and a team outreach that I think you know obviously is helping a specific community but also also showing um, to a fan base that like and these are things we do even in normal times too but it, it just it's one of it's it's another way to um, talk about how the club is invested in the community um, not just on a soccer side but on, a, on I think a human side. Yeah, it's nice to highlight, you know, it brings a spotlight onto these things and people at the moment want some good news stories. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think that's, you know, that's something that everybody's trying to find, um, find ways to, to show both somewhat the reality, like, you know, yeah, this is hard. Um, and this is different. And this is not normal. And we, gosh, gosh, we miss soccer too. Um, but also we miss soccer too, just like you guys. So um, and, and being, I think, upfront and honest about that, I think is, is been, is really important. Yeah. And just finally, I mean, what do you think you'll take from this personally, from this experience? <sighs> you know, I think it's interesting to think about that. Um, I, I think it's, it's really interesting to look at, um, work life, work life balance and how that, um, is completely different. You know, sports is a huge, um, time commitment for an, uh, for a career um, and having the ability to sort of rethink, not rethink, but um, rework that balance is kind of interesting. Um, I think, you know, building, uh, one of the things that I think has been really interesting and it was true, certainly for MLS, there's always been a great sense of collaboration among clubs. Um, I know any number of different counterparts of different teams that I can call up and say, Hey, I've got this idea. Uh, let's, you know, what do you think? Oh, and, or, Hey, I saw this cool thing you did. How did you do it? What did you do? Like, how, and, and that, that sense of collaboration and everybody kind of feeling the sense of being, we're all in this together, I think has been amplified even more so. Um, and I think that's really inspiring to see as people start to think like, you know, yes, you want to win on the field. Yes. There's a competitive aspect to the business. Um, but there's also uh, a really collaborative aspect to the business that's going to help me and it's going to help your team and your club and even across different sports too. So I think, you know, there's the personal level that I think is interesting in finding that balance, but also the, the broadening of that experience and that uh, collaboration. And I think is, is only getting more, more expanded during this time that I think is really exciting. Yeah, definitely. I think, I don't think that, work work as we know it the way we do work is going to can go back to the way it was i think we're all kind of taking stock of that and i hope some of these things do stick and the collaboration stays around for a long time afterwards yeah yeah me too <laughs> well thank you very much brian pleasure talking to you and thank you for taking the time out i appreciate it thanks for having me